Jesus glad and the devil mad. Amen. Let's rejoice. Let's get right into the word tonight. Tonight we are talking about the spiritual war. And um, as so many of you, I have just been uh, just weary, not in my spirit, but just in my mind. Uh, The word doesn't want us to faint in our mind, but there is an attack against Christians in our nation, and it is sad when it bring when they bring it down to the kids. And so my heart went out like yours did this week to the children of Covenant Christian School and also the adults that serve there in that entire community. I also am a Christian school parent, and so this hit me. I took it personally. And while I don't want to walk in my emotions, I got to tell you, there is a spiritual war. And I think people are finally, I believe, let me tell it this way. I believe people are finally waking up. I believe Christians are finally realizing they're waking up. And wow, there is a war raging and I have not been a part of it. And so I just want to just encourage you tonight uh, with some familiar scriptures, but hopefully in a new way, and the Holy Spirit can breathe on those and make them alive to you. And so we'll just read right out of Ephesians 6, uh, 10. It says, finally, my brethren, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, the dunamis, the dynamite, dynamic working, miracle working power of his might, not of our might. And it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or military strategies of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And so church, I want to talk about that spiritual war tonight. We have spiritual armor. We do not have to give our our mortal lives for this cause, but God does want our obedience and he does call us to take up his armor around us. And so he has given us all the tools that we need to fight this war. And notice that it is not against flesh and blood. It is not against flesh and blood. Uh, But it is against the demonic principalities that rule and reign in people's people's minds and in the mind of the society at large around us. And so really it is truly a war of ideas. There are bad ideas that are taking root right now that are new. Uh, Can you imagine 10 years ago if someone told you uh, that we would be teaching children in school that they could choose their their gender or that we would have little babies born and we would have a whole, we would have whole groups of parents who decide not to give their child a name of either gender or they would just let them pick when the... Who would, we would have thought, well, that's just crazy. And we may have just patted that person on the head and said, oh, honey, you'll see the truth someday. But I'm telling you, God is calling us to stand. We've got to stand against bad ideas. Let me tell you about some bad ideas in history. When there's a bad idea, you know, Hitler had a bad idea. His bad idea is that one race of people was causing all of Germany's problems. And therefore, he needed to eradicate Uh, those people. That was a bad idea. Obviously, it doesn't make any rational sense. It doesn't make any moral or ethical sense. Uh, And it's it's true in that day that the church of Germany was very strong outwardly. They had many, many numbers of Lutheran Christian believers who were born again in Germany who did not fight the war of ideas against Hitler. They just patted him on the head and all of his ideas got to spew out. And, and they, it could be, the case could be made and has been made uh, that the church let Hitler dominate them and then let those Jews die. 
those six million Jews, it led to something bad. What's another bad idea in our society that we can think? Marxism, well, that's a terrible idea. Communism is a terrible idea. It has always led to death and poverty and misery. There is no, the only people happy in communist, communism is, is the leaders, the few at the very top, the oligarchs, those are the happy ones in communism. We know this if we studied history, but there is a, there's a darkness over the people that hides the truth. Um, the, the Karl Barks said, from each, according to his ability, to each, according to his need. It sounds so nice, but it's a terrible idea. It's a bad idea, and it should have been squelched it should have been stomped out, but it was allowed to exist. So in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, reading in verse 3, uh, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare uh, are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So these strongholds, again, are ideas um, because then it says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In other words, Paul was speaking to his church that he had some authority over and he loved them fiercely and he guarded the ideas that came into their minds. And, um, you know, I have heard this scripture most of my entire life and I have used and applied the scripture. This scripture is about casting down imagination. So in, and I have applied the scripture and always heard it taught that we apply it in our minds when we have a thought that comes in from the devil, a thought that conflicts with the word of God that we know is true. When we have a thought that drags us down, that accuses us, and we know Satan is the accuser of the brethren, that we're to take that thought into captivity and we're to court martial that thought and we're going to throw it in jail and it does not get to uh, keep running on repeat in our mind. And, and so we are supposed to cast that out and we're supposed to replace it by speaking the word of God. And that's a wonderful way to apply that scripture. It is awesome. That is how we renew our mind uh, in, in the word. And it's wonderful. But you know what? We have done that. Many of our mature believers are doing that every day in our mind. But we are not doing that for our society. And I believe there is a macro. We can apply this to our micro but we need to be applying it to our macro in our society. Uh, we will not be able to mind control everyone. We don't even want to do that. The left is the people who want to mind control, but we do want to use our words to convey the ideas that God has about mankind. And we should not let bad ideas go unanswered. We should not do it. I'm telling you the church, we're where we're at today because many times the church has been silent or we thought those ideas were so ridiculous, so patently wrong that everyone would see it. Everyone would agree with us. Are you kidding me? Wear a mask uh, because of a respiratory virus that's this small that can get through every hole in that mask like a million times? How, what? That doesn't make any sense. Cancel church? You know, um, it's interesting, France, uh, last I heard, the whole nation of France is uh, burning. People are rioting there. People are really upset there. And you know what started that riot in France? Um, they moved the retirement age. Uh, you can't get your re retirement uh, benefits now for an, an additional two years. So I can't remember if it was 62. I should have looked that up. But let's say it was, uh, the, the, you were going to get your uh, retirement benefits at 62, but they moved it. Now you got to wait till you're 64. I'm telling you, people are taken to the streets. They are so angry. They are so impassioned and inflamed. Give me my stuff. Government, give me my stuff. And, um, and I look at the church, I look at the church and, you know, in 2020, uh, you know, how important, how important is church to us? How important, how 
precious is the word of God to us? How important is it to, for us to come together in fellowship of believers and communion of the saints, to literally take the Holy Communion together to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ? How important is that? And where were the Christians in the streets saying, we don't want you to shut down church? If they're rioting in France over retirement, where was the passion of the church people to say, we will not be told by the government to shut our doors. We saw it in little tiny bits, but it should have been so much more massive. And so we are not combating bad ideas. We have played nice with these bad ideas too long, and we have allowed the devil to come and build, it says, strongholds, arguments, and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Stronghold, those are, I, I just um, don't watch a lot of TV anymore, but recently I watched the nerdiest. Oh, y'all would think I was so nerdy to even see, but I did watch a documentary on the castles of England. And, uh, oh my gosh, the, 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 these high towers that people would build, and, the, and for hundreds of years, they would be the pride and joy of the entire country. Oh, this is where my king lives way up in this castle. It's impenetrable. And then my king installed all of these giant cannons everywhere. I'm telling you, if we let the devil build a stronghold in our mind, that's one thing. But when we let him build a stronghold in our society where he is shooting out bad ideas uh, constantly at our kids uh, and, and, and these bad ideas uh, somebody said, well, I believe it was Voltaire that said, if, if, if someone will believe, if you can get someone to believe uh, absurdity, you can get them to commit atrocity. And I want you to think about that for a minute because we are asking people to believe the absur- absurd, that there are more than two genders, that, um, that there is no God at all, that you, whatever your truth is to you right now, that's what's really true. And therefore you're in charge. You're the arbiter of all truth because I can't tell you what your truth is and you can't tell me what my truth is. And there is no truth at all. These are absurd. These are terrible ideas. And we're allowing the devil to just cannon through our society, but no more. I'm telling you no more because God has given us his armor. It's a prayer armor. It is a covering. And we have got to be engaged and strapped on because we can't just push it away and be nice and pat it on the head anymore because it's coming for our kids in Christian school. Y'all, it happened this week. The spirit of this age it, he does not play fair. And, um, and so it's time for the church. And I believe there is such a revival. Look, uh, I don't want to make this too heavy. Jesus said, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In fact, let's just go there. Um, it is in, uh, let's go to Matthew 11. Um, and I should have marked this too. I'm just so, I'm, I just want to give you some, some fire tonight. Um, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and, you, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, verse 29, upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle. See, Jesus said he is gentle and lowly in heart. He's humble. He knows that there is a God and he is God in heaven, but he's submitted to the Father God and he is lowly and you will find rest for your souls. There is a rest that comes from acknowledging the lordship of Jesus. There is a rest when you don't have to think you are in charge of everything, when you don't have to do everything in your own strengths. I'm telling you, there is a rest. There is a security and a peace that the world outside lacks and they sometimes hate us for it because they are so jealous and cut to the heart. But it says, my, then he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I am going to give a yoke to you, Jesus. He didn't say it was non-existent. You are going to wear a yoke 
What was a yoke? It was a wooden implement that bound you together to other oxen, other beasts of burden, so that you could together pull a load through the field, a plow. Uh, you could break up the earth. You could do war- farming work. Um, it was, you have a job to do. And we are gonna be yoked up with other believers. He did not say, it was non-existent. He said it was easy and it was light. How is this work that he's given us to do, how will it ever be easy and light when we see such darkness out in the world today? How could it be easy and light? And uh, I'll tell you why, the Holy Ghost. It is because the Holy Ghost is yoked up with you. You are yoked up with other believers, yes, but you are also yoked up with the one who hovered over the waters when God created the heavens and the earth. You are yoked up with the third person of the Godhead living on the inside of you and you have mighty power. Be strong in that power, Ephesians said. Be strong in that mighty power because that is where uh, that is where you will be able to pull that load and it will feel light to you, but it will be a significant load. It will change this world. Let God use you, let him, let him use you to carry that yoke. And, uh, and then he hinted that, hey, um, it's easy and it's light. But then in just four chapters later in Matthew 16, he said, um, Verse 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. That's the yoke right there. Take up his cross and follow me. Jesus just wants us to follow in his footsteps, to just simply obey him. Uh, in, in Luke, it said, he, he quotes the same passage again, but he said, follow me, take up his cross daily and follow me. Every day we take up and we just listen to Jesus and it's not hard. For Jesus, it was hard. He carried it for us. It was a redemptive carrying. He carried it away so we would not have to carry a heavy burden, but we do carry it. Follow me and for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And who, in other words, if we selfishly hoard and follow our own desires and instincts and whims, we will lose out on the good life that God has for us. We will lose out on true purpose. But he says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it or will find true life. Because look, what we see in this world, what what we experience in our physical bodies It is, we are in the natural seen realm and Jesus said, and Paul said that those things that we see are temporal, but the things which are unseen are eternal. The eternal things, the things that really matter are things we cannot see, taste, smell, touch, hear. We can't sense them. We have to have our faith sense fully activated. And that is true life that we get by taking up our cross. What, and, and so, um, for what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what may, shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the son of man will come in glory of his father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. You know, we preach the full gospel of the word of God here at this church. We preach the salvation of, uh, by faith through grace. And you, will, you are saved. You go to heaven not because you do anything right. You get to go to heaven because of what Jesus did right. And you just identify with it by your faith and you access his grace, and that's how you're saved. That's how you gain entrance to heaven. But listen to what Jesus said. He will reward you according to your works. So your heavenly, the reward over and above just getting your ticket to heaven, your reward does come from what you do in this life. 
Use it wisely. Let the Holy Ghost hook up with you. Let him yoke up with you. It's awesome. That is true life. True life, a fulfilling life, is not hiding in a corner from the devil. True life is engaging in this conflict right here that God put us in in the world. And we are not to be silent or to take a back seat, but there is a way. It says, take up your cross. And so we've got to find that thing that we are called to do every day. What is that thing that God wants me to to do today? And in our mind, it might not look like a big thing, but I'm telling you for the kingdom of God, obedience is success. Taking up your cross, obedience is is success. And together we're going to yoke up and we're going to get that job done. We're going to get that field plowed. We're going to get that harvest in for the kingdom of God just in the nick of time. And we are going to be rewarded according to those works. Amen. And so that's our spiritual warfare. I just have a couple of early examples. Uh, The early church uh, had to do this a lot. And, and I like to play the early church card because we have, and I have grown up and you have been in a generation where other generations had to fight for our freedom here in the United States, but we have not had to fight for really anything. We just got to grow up and have enough food and have a roof over our head. Most of us, some of us had to struggle, some of us, um, but but uh, other people mostly have cared for us, have, and they've given us a system of government that mostly works. There's mostly, um, you know, but we're seeing that erode and we're seeing, we're, we're waking up to the fact that we have a part to play in that, aren't we? And so in the early church, they had tremendous persecution. They had tremendous uh, uh, lack of freedom to worship as they saw fit. And um, I saw two bad ideas. We're talking about these bad ideas that we're casting down, that we're court-martialing, that we're bringing into captivity uh, for the kingdom of God. And, um, and so in Acts 4, I identified a couple of them here in the early church. This is not an exhaustive list. But if you go to Acts 4, uh, and we're going to read about Peter and John, listen to this. Um, now, as they spoke to the people, that's Peter and John and the, and the other apostles, the, um, the priests the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. So the important people, the really religious people who were supposed to be so enlightened, and the the government officials, they all came upon the apostles. And these people, why did they come upon and why did they come against the apostles? Because they were greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So we see right here that the Sadducees came against the disciples because the disciples preached the resurrection from the dead. Well, you know what? Everybody knows. What is the defining characteristic of the, of the Sadducee? They don't believe in resurrection from the dead. So if it were the church today, the church today would say, oh, you know, they don't believe in the resurrection from the dead. If I just don't preach about that, I'll preach about all the other things. Look at all the Old Testament. I could preach about Moses and I can preach about all the, ooh, but I don't want to, if I preach about the resurrection from the dead, those people are going to be really mad at me. And I want to really grow my church. You know, I want to have a church growth program. So I don't want to say that pet thing that they don't want me to. Okay. I'm going to button my lip and I'm not going to say that. Um, That is not what the apostles did. If the apostles would have caved into that, we would not have salvation today and the early church would have died out and that would be it. But no. And, and, and so, and they, and the apostles had to overcome because those Bad people came against them, laid hands on them, and put them in custody until the next day. And it was about evening. However, many, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So there was great fruit when they did push the button of the Sadducees. But they had to push the button. If you come to church, and if you go to any, any good Bible-believing church, they ought to be pushing some buttons, Yes, there's a resurrection from the dead. <laughs> yes. And you know what? And then, they, and then they got, and then the Sadducees told them, don't preach in the name of Jesus. Don't, pre- we're in charge here. Do not preach in the name of Jesus. You can say, don't talk about him. Don't mention his name. Don't mention his name. And guess what they did? They mentioned his name. In uh, Acts 5, 
verse 42, and daily in the temple, I mean in the temple, not and in every house, yes, in private, but in the temple, on social media, at the school board prayer meeting, or like prayer after the school board meeting or whatever, during, when everybody didn't want him to, they did not cease, did not cease, did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. I love it. They went there. They pushed the button. They mentioned the name of Jesus. They stood against the bad idea. And they used their mouth to do it. They did it out loud and in public. And, uh, and here was another bad idea. Uh, in verse, in chapter six, now the very next, we were just in five, now we're in six. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of Stephen the martyr? Uh, I, I've been meditating on this because I really, I see those people who died in Tennessee. Uh, I don't know any of those families. I do not know what they personally believed about the salvation of Jesus. I don't know their, the state of their soul, but I do know that they were called by his name. I do know that they went to a school that called itself a Christian school. And they seem to be, and one family at least was a, was a family of a pastor at that Presbyterian church. And um, so they were named with the name of Jesus and they are martyrs for his name because they were targeted for being Christians and that's why they were killed by the spirit of this age, by someone who had a really, really bad idea. A lot of bad ideas piled up on top of each other that made their, rendered their mind uh, uh, completely use, clouded and, uh, and, and diverted from, from, from reality. So those people were martyrs. They were modern day martyrs. So Stephen was an early church martyr. Let's read about him. Uh, it started like this in Acts 6, verse 8. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So he was not just someone who debated with words and used words only. He had signs following, and he was not an apostle. Stephen was actually, if you look back uh, earlier in this chapter, he was just one of the guys that was a appointed by the, the early church to serve tables. He was an usher. He was a children's minister. He was a ministry of helps in the local church there. And we have awesome ministry of helps in this church. And many of them are, are even here tonight on it. It's, a, it's an online only service. And yet we've got ministry of helps here helping to make this service possible tonight. The ministry of helps. So Stephen was one of those people. And he was full of faith and power, and he did great wonders and signs among the people. And then there arose from uh, some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. So it was people from a certain area that had a particular doctrine. In another version of the Bible, it calls it the, uh, the libertines. And so some people think, well, okay, this was a cult of that day that followed somebody named Liber uh, that believed that, hey, if it feels good, do it. Woo, you know, I'm in charge here. There's no higher power. Whatever feels good to me today, that's what I'm going to do. And if you don't like it, then I don't like you. And I want you to be, dr I want you to be silenced. And so that is the same spirit of this age that we're dealing with today. It is a spirit of hedonism. It is a spirit of selfish lust, of unchecked uh, emotion, and, and it is a bad, it is a bad idea. And we are to speak the word of God against that idea, and that's what Stephen did. And what did they do? This will sound familiar. First of all, they tried disputing with him. So disputing with Stephen, and they they were not able, verse 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So what did they do? They could not beat him in a debate. They could, they saw, and he had all these signs and wonders. He had the works, he had the words, but Holy Ghost inspired words, and he had the full package, and these people, these hedonists could not defeat him, so they made up a lie. 
And they induced secretly men to say, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against, the, against Moses and against God. And so they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council, and they set up false witnesses. So that's, that, is the, that has always been the tool of the devil. It is still the tool of the devil. But guess what? We have a word that says, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against us in judgment shall be condemned, shown to be in the wrong. We have the word of God to hurl back. We have the whole armor of God. We have the mission of Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit yoked up with us and on the inside of us. And we, our words, our words win against these these spirits. Now, Stephen... Stephen, his physical body did not win. Um, he did give his life that day because he was, he was stoned to death uh, for standing. But, but guess who was standing there watching the whole thing? Saul of Tarsus. And uh, Saul of Tarsus was consenting to his death in chapter eight, verse one. And then in, by chapter nine, Saul of Tarsus gets saved. Saul is the main persecutor of the church and he gets saved and everything turns around. And I'm telling you, I'm waiting for that minute. I am waiting uh, for, for revival to come to our nation. I'm not just waiting, I am praying. I am acting in my faith. I am doing stuff. And we as a church are banding together and yoking up and taking up our cross and speaking God's word into the situation. We are hurling our uh, you know, in the, in the whole armor of God, it says that we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so we're using that word. And, um, and so I'm going to close with this. Um, and it said, uh, Acts 9, now Saul finally gets saved because he saw Stephen. He saw the courageous way that he did not deny his faith. He saw, and that was a seed. See, Stephen's death was a seed that grew into the apostle Paul and his giant ministry that now we, encourages us so much every day. And it says in chapter 9, verse 31, then the churches had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. I'm telling you, we can have multiplication. We can have peace. We can have rest. We can have Jesus's easy yoke and his light burden uh, if we will just accept our mission. But we cannot sleep anymore. The devil is running about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He knows his time is short and it's time for us to rise up as a church. And will we yoke together and take up our cross? Will we do it today, church? Um, I believe we will. Amen. <laughs>